Hey folks, it's Laura with Rain Tree Nursery and today we are at the beautiful Kailash community mm -hmm. with Ole Erson, who is one of the members here and oh my gosh there are so many gorgeous things that we're seeing i've never been here and so i'll be uh, i'll be learning along with you so ole tell us about this lovely spot okay great so we're a community we're an intentional community we're about 55 residents wow. we started in 2007 uh -huh. so this is our 13th year here and when we started this was a rundown apartment building and the grounds were just parking lot gravel and a few ornamental shrubs and our approach has been to turn it into food production mm -hmm. organic gardening and then do fun projects that are sustainable like solar energy and rainwater harvesting mm -hmm. and composting we even compost our poop here <laughs> okay so it's one human of our for yeah, the human win. manure right but yeah <laughs> we actually are fully permitted by the city of portland oh my yeah, gosh right, yeah. so so we do all kinds of cool stuff like that and um, we, because we're a community, we work on community self-governance mm -hmm. and we try and share as much as we can. Of course, in communities, it gives a tremendous opportunity to share tools and getting together and eating together and presentations. So there's all kinds of things that we do like that. And I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, I'm sure we'll see a lot of these pieces, but uh, an intentional community for, for our folks who may not be familiar with the term is a place where people come together on purpose to live together communally. There's a, exactly, yeah. there are rules that everybody agrees to follow and there's usually mediation if there's, you know, inevitable disagreements or right. when you create new processes, you can all come together and create the processes together. So it's not just an apartment building with cool people who've rented spots. It's people that actually choose to live together and Absolutely. That was Absolutely, what you yes, wanted right, exactly, when you yeah, set right. this whole thing and up. One of the things that's unique about our situation is you may have heard of co-housing. Does mm -hmm. that ring a bell? Right. Mm -hmm. So co-housing is a condominium model and you have to have deep pockets in order to afford a condominium. Sure. So our residents tend to be low income and mm -hmm. some are really ultra low income. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a rental model here. You can come in with a very minimal commitment. One year is our minimum commitment. Mm -hmm. You can give 30 days notice after that time. So you're not uh, bound to come up with a couple hundred thousand dollar nest egg right. to move into a place. Uh, so we've given an opportunity to participate in community mm -hmm. for low income people that wouldn't have an opportunity otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's kind of a, a core group of folks who sort of hold the form of the community and some people will come and go and then others kind of come and stay, I'm sure, right? Yeah, we have a regular turnover this year. We've had uh, less than half a dozen out of 50, but it's a regular turnover, about that many every mm -hmm. year, but there is a core group of people. One, ac one of our residents actually has lived here 33 years. Now, of course, he was here before 10, 10, 30 uh, what 20 years before we started yeah but he's uh seen the the real history and how things have evolved on our watch uh -huh. and of course how things were going beforehand when this place started out in 1959 it was a high-end apartment building uh -huh. that was the age of sputnik <laughs> you know uh space age and appliances so every unit had a dishwasher oh wow uh, i mean which was kind of unusual mm -hmm. and it had some community spaces it had what was called a gymnasium oh. plus a community room now that was probably unusual for the 1950s uh -huh. unfortunately it fell on hard times those spaces were boarded up and in fact um, George who's been here 33 years doesn't recall those spaces ever being open so wow. they probably the communal the initial communal spaces didn't even last that long mm. so anyway we've restored all those we have restored the community room where we get together and have all kinds of meetings and it's got a full kitchen and all and uh, the gymnasium space we've turned into residential space. Uh-huh. Oh, this is wonderful. <sighs> so much to see. All right, lead the way. Okay. Uh, so where would you like to go next? Tell us a little bit more, perhaps. Um, well, uh, how about we walk over and we look at this really cool okay, sculpture sure. here. 
All right, so this, this amazing thing behind us, uh, it looks like some like amazing contraption. What is it? So this is a rainwater sculpture. So yeah. one of our uh, projects here is rainwater harvesting. Uh -huh. So this is a huge building. It's 10,000 square feet of roof. And it's a gable roof, which means half the water goes one way and half the other way. The north side rain is actually channeled around the building at roof height and then comes across from the building to this uh, arch shaped structure and then the water is diverted through the rain chains and through the and through water wheels. The water on the south side of the building comes around at that corner of the building. Uh, it comes directly down to the ground and then creates a rainwater stream. So when it starts raining uh, this sculpture comes alive with flowing water and we also have a creek that starts flowing. So it's one of our projects. We like to do art projects. We like to have fun. Mm -hmm. We like to experiment. Yeah. This has evolved over the years. And, and the, the, the stream itself, is that, is that a rain garden? Does it infiltrate it into does. the subsoil? Exactly. As the water flows, it gradually is percolating into the ground. Uh, for a small rain, usually it makes it only a few feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's a sustained rain, then the, the stream will flow all the way down to here, make it to the pond, and rarely get farther than that. But if we have rainfall for days, it will fill the entire System. structure. Yeah, right. And so when we started the project, uh, all of the roof water, all of the parking lot water went into the sanitary sewer system, yeah. which overburdens the sanitary sewer system. Right. So one of our projects, and it's encouraged by the city of Portland, mm -hmm. is to keep all of your rainwater, or what they call stormwater, on site. Mm -hmm. So now all of the roof water goes into the swales starting right here. And even the parking lot water, we have drains that cut the parking lot into three partitions and then that water is also diverted into our swales here. Perfect. So we we actually don't save rain for our gardening projects uh -huh. and other projects. We have a well here. We drill the 100 foot well but uh, keeping the rainwater on site replenishes the huge aquifer that's underneath Portland. Absolutely. So it makes sense. It makes total sense. And I understand that you can turn this on with a with a little switch and get a sense of exactly. what it's like now, without the rain, right? We ha when we give tours, we like to show people what it looks like, and most of the time it's not raining. So when we give the signal, then the rain miraculously appears, and it, all it is is well water that's diverted into the top of the structure. Shall we do it? Yes, let's go for it. Okay, turn on the rain! So this is the side, this is the south side of the building, right? right? Exactly. And yeah. this is what you were talking about, um, the extension of the rain garden. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what we're seeing here. Okay, so if you look up on the eaves, right under the gutters, you'll see large pipes that collect all the water on this side of the building and it comes down right there at that Oh yeah, they're pipe big here. black pipes, right? Exactly, yeah, uh -huh. right there. And it drops all the way down there and then comes out about 15 feet into the middle of a log here. So these are the south side rain gardens where we create a rainwater creek. Okay, And to do that we depaved three and a half parking spaces right here. Wow. Uh, so the water comes down here and gurgles out of the stump and mm -hmm. then flows down the hillside and joins the water from the north side of the building which we saw comes down in the rainwater sculpture. Right. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That is gorgeous. And it's just, I love to believe that concrete is not forever. Concrete is yeah, not forever. I love this. So one of the things that I see here, and I love this, is signage. There is signage all over the place. There are opportunities for people who are coming to visit, 
or who know about you and want to see what you're doing here to have a passive educational experience just like we did we drove up we parked we said wow this is really cool and then all of a sudden we saw a sign and we're drawn to it and we actually learned what was happening right here i so rarely see this in wonderful public demonstrations and it's such an easy thing to do. They're not terribly expensive to make. You don't have to have docents here all the time to have an educational experience. We were very, very lucky. You know, uh, all of the residents who live here uh, are required to put in effort on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. One of our residents was a sign maker. <laughs> so isn't that great? Yeah. So he actually helped develop all this signage here. We have about 30 signs around the property. And that was one of his volunteer projects that met his requirements for probably the year. Yeah. Because you know, he put so much work into it. What a great treat. And uh, speaking of depaving, we've depaved three and a half parking spots here in our circular garden out in front where we st started the uh, discussion. That actually was 12 parking spaces, 5,500 square feet of asphalt. So we've depaved probably about 6,000 square feet of asphalt at this point. And I'm guessing that you used those pieces of urbanite um, as bed edges? Actually not. No? No, we actually had eight full dumpsters of asphalt wow. and Portland sand and gravel actually recycles that into new asphalt. Oh, it was asphalt. asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, asphalt. so yeah, no, you yeah. wouldn't want to use yeah. that. So they grind the that up, make yeah. aggregate, and then that's turned into new asphalt. So it's totally recycled. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. All right, let's see something else. Okay. So we're here in the center of our circular garden. What this is, is a 3,100 or 3,200 square foot circle split into six slices, like six slices of pizza, arrayed around this sprinkler right here. There are three sprinklers here. And what these, each one of these sprinklers does one third of the garden. You can actually, by turning all three on at the same time, you can sprinkle the whole area. But if you know about gardening in Oregon, we have very, very dry summers. And it's absolutely essential to have some sort of mechanism to uh, mechanize your irrigation otherwise you're moving hoses around and sprinklers around and all of that uh, and spending a lot of time with not a lot of productivity so this one sprinkler right here in the center allows us to sprinkle the entire garden very very easily we turn it on about three times a week uh, so looking around here we'll see carrots and beans right here behind me we've got uh, uh, chard on this side here some beets, asparagus on this sector right here. These are different uh, brassica family. Uh, and our last two are peppers on this side and more uh, brassicas and chard on that circle there. And around the circular garden, we have the swales, which take the, the rainwater from the building uh, as well as the parking lot and the water flows all the way around the garden into the front which is the lowest point on the property so we have a depression here if it rains and rains and rains for days then we'll actually fill that up in general most of the water percolates into the ground long before it gets to that point I recognize this tree this this is a pawpaw tree right, right. we have two varieties of pawpaw that we started about 2010 and you can see the fruits right Look at here. That. Are, those so, are those soft yet? Okay. Oh yeah, they're a little yeah. soft. Okay, so these probably could be picked, yeah, but we've been harvesting them for about the last month and they have kind of a really tropical custard flavor. Mm -hmm. They, I think, come from the Midwest, mm -hmm. so it's a really hot area. They don't do so well here. The, the key thing is if you want to get a lot of fruits you actually have to hand pollinate them with a little paintbrush. Mm, yeah. They are pollinated by the corpse fly and we don't have a lot of corpse flies here mm -hmm. so you need to hand pollinate and then you get a really good crop so nice uh, and how old are these trees so these were started about 2010 when we planted them they were not much bigger than a foot or so tall they were seedlings and you can see how big they are now wow like nine years later or so <laughs> this is very cool do you know what varieties these are uh one is um mango and the other one is, I, I have to look it up we've got everything recorded on our 
Um, yeah, I, I am blanking on the name yeah. right now. One of them is Mango, though. Nice. Yeah. Oh, super neat. So I see that when you take out parking places, you have to accommodate bike storage, right? Uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> there's a lot of avid bicyclists here, and we're actually talking now about getting some solar bikes or some uh, e-bikes that are powered oh, yeah. by solar electricity. But yeah, we have bike parking behind us. You can see covered bike parking for 48 bikes, and we have uncovered for another 48, so about 100 bike parking area wow. here. And then in this shed also, we store our garden tools and we have a fire emergency firewood storage right behind us here. And one of our coolest features is our solar shower. So if you look up on the roof here, you can see a big coil of black pipe. Oh yeah. That's a hundred feet of, I think it's a uh, one and a quarter inch pipe. Uh, and that contains about six or eight gallons of, of water. It gets really hot, 130 degrees. And then that water's channeled over to the shower stall right behind us. And spring, summer, oh. and fall. Spring, summer, and fall, we get uh, really nice hot showers um, that people love to come out here for a shower because it's so bright. Look at this! Uh, and you, of course, you're not using any fossil fuels for your nice hot shower. Oh my gosh, this is amazing! So you can see it's got the little shower curtain here so people can have a little bit of privacy. You see the signage. Of course, I love the signage. And then you have this lovely little shower stall right here. Oh, that is so charming. Okay, I'm doing this at my house. This is awesome. Wow. <laughs> so welcome to the urination station. This is not just for collecting urine. We do have a, a male urinal right here, you can see. But we have a regular compost toilet here. This is a regular bucket toilet. There you can see what's there. That one is actually full and ready to take to the compost area. These are, this is what we call the additive, just finely ground wood chips after use. You use a few handfuls of that to cover, uh, and then that's taken to the compost processor, which we'll visit momentarily. We also do a lot of urine recycling here. So if you think about it, uh, in our excretion, about 90% of the volume and weight of our excrement is liquid. Uh, urine is generally pathogen free and doesn't require much processing to enable it to be used on the garden and allow you to recycle all of the nutrients. Uh, solids, on the other hand, have to be high temperature composted because they're full of pathogens. So here at Kailash Eco Village, we have maybe a dozen people who are participating in this program and each resident who participates will have one of these portable compost toilets that they set next to their flush toilet and then regularly they bring out bins to be composted in the compost area. We actually have more residents collecting their pee. Usually residents collect their pee in bottles or buckets. And then we have storage for about 1,250 gallons of pee behind the urination station. You'll see that in a moment too. And you were saying that, um, you were saying that you're fully permitted by the city of Portland for this system, right? right? Yeah, right. yeah. And that people come from all over the world to see how you do this? Yeah, and we're wow. written up in some European journals too. So uh, I want to put in a plug here for Oregon Recode. About six, seven years ago, there was a group that formed. Uh, their goal is to make sustainability legal. And their approach is to create new building codes that can then be adopted and allow these practices which were outlaw practices in the past. Uh, so because of their efforts, uh, there's now a composting toilet and urine recycling building code that we followed to get fully permitted by the city of Portland. Wow. So all, we're totally illegal here. That's great. Yeah, when I'm talking to folks about growing plants, especially plants that have a lot of leafy growth, 
I, I mention, if I don't think I'm going to freak them out too much, that we all make a wonderful nitrogen rich liquid urine, a liquid fertilizer several times a day, and I like to call it liquid gold. And then I encourage them to use one part liquid gold and three parts water fresh on any anything that needs a boost and that is mostly leaves because wow I mean that's nutrition right there and such a shame to throw away all of this beautiful nutrition rich stuff right we're animals that's how nature stayed fertile before we started putting it all into the water stream and uh, I am so proud of these folks for closing the loop and putting it back in the soil. Nice job. What's so cool is that little baby step of just saving your pea and putting it on your garden is so easy to do, but it allows you to recycle like 90% of your nutrients. Yeah, it's as they say, it's a true golden opportunity. <laughs> Nicely said. So this is where you treat the urine, correct? Right, exactly, yeah. So the building codes actually require that you sequester your urine for six months. When you do that, the urea splits into ammonia and that ammonia is very alkaline. It raises the pH to about 9.5 oh. and it kills any pathogens. Wow. So that actually occurs in as little time as a month. Uh, but to be co to be extra careful, the building codes require six months. Now, to be quite honest, if you're just using pea on your own garden, you can use it fresh. There really isn't any concern. If you're in a community like this, we, uh, we have to be a little bit more careful. I mean, many people just go out and pee in the garden in the middle of the backyard. We don't do that here mm -hmm. because we have a community of 50 people. So I have a bottle of pea here that I've collected in my unit. This is how uh, residents typically bring their pee or they bring it in buckets. And then this is the tank that we're currently filling. You can see it's about 80% full right now. We simply take the cap off, pour the pee in. And recap the tank. Then the bottle needs to be rinsed about four times to make it to rinse away any ammonia type odor. And then you're ready to start over again. How simple. Mm, good stuff. Simple is good. Yeah. Very nice. All right, so now this is the solid stuff, right? Exactly. This is where we compost in a outdoor compost processor. The humanure, with, this is a mixture of excreta, uh, feces, some pee, toilet paper, and what we call additive. Uh, and that mixture is perfect because it's, it's got all the nutrients balanced to compost so well. So in people's units, in resident units, they'll have one of those uh, little portable compost loos, we call them. We actually have a library of loos here. So when a resident moves in, they can check out one of the library loos if they want to see if that's something they would like to do. Not all residents compost their poop here or participate in the compost uh, process here, mm -hmm. but many do. Uh, and if you do, then you fill up a bucket mm -hmm. uh, and then the buckets are brought back here and about once a month we have a work party. So we're almost ready for a work party day after tomorrow. We're actually going to process these 35 buckets here. Mm. What we do is we uh, dump these into an empty bin or a bin that's partially filled. As we dump in this material here, we make sure we have a uh, layer of wood chips right next to the concrete blocks all the way around the center. That way none of this mixture here touches the blocks. That six inches or so of wood chips also insulates the material inside, mm. which gets actually very, very hot. Mm -hmm. We've studied this very carefully. We keep very careful temperature records, and we actually bring all our compost to pathogen uh, destroying or pasteurization temperatures here. Uh, so it's a very, very effective process. It takes a fair amount of work to move around your excrement, toilet paper, and additive. But hey, you get all those nutrients and you're building topsoil. Mm -hmm. It turns out that in the 13 years we've been on the property here, we probably created about this much new topsoil over the entire garden area. And we have a what? garden area of probably about an acre, acre and a half. 
That's, I mean, that's amazing. A, a general rule of thumb is in a natural system, it usually takes a hundred years to create one inch of topsoil. So you said in 13 years, 13 years you've created 12 inches? Probably 8 to 12 inches eight right there. So this is topsoil production on steroids. Wow. Absolutely, yeah. Well, since, Now, of yeah. course, not all of that is human manure composting. We do a ton of regular compost, kitchen composting and garden scrap composting too. But it's all things that were ye eaten here on site, generated on site. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Right. That's, That's the wonder of organic gardening. <sighs> that is nutrient cycling at its finest. All right, now this is something I have never even heard of before. So Tell this is one it. of our funnest project. It's called a squash tunnel. What these are is cattle panels right. that you can get at a farm store like Coastal Farm, I think these came from. Uh -huh. They're about $20, $25 a piece, 16 feet long. And if you make them in the form of an arch, uh -huh. one after the other, you create a tunnel effect. Then you plant squashes or pole beans on the side. The plants grow up and totally cover the <laughs> scaffolding, the this uh, steel scaffolding. Uh -huh. And the squashes hang down like Christmas ornaments. Oh so my gosh. Uh, about a month ago, before we harvested them all, this was full of dozens. I think we had about 500 squash all together <laughs> this year. And that's part of the community, uh, the group gardens program. Uh -huh. But it's a really, really simple thing to put together. These panels are inexpensive and it makes a really fun geometry as well. It's very, very practical. And you said that in the wintertime people use this for clothes drying? Of course, right. In the wintertime there's nothing growing on it so you can see clothes are hanging to dry. What a great use multi -use, of the space. Yeah, multi-use, right? Multi-use space, right. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Very clever. Wow, this happens to be, I think, one of the most elaborate compost setups I've ever seen. But for 55 people, yeah, I right. mean, it'd have to be big, right? Right, yeah. So we started out using pallets we would wire pallets together and it worked for a few years. The problem is it's virtually impossible to rat proof pallets. So what happens is the rats will excavate anywhere in the pile because they have all these gaps between the boards and that you can go anywhere and they can come out and then dash in one into another bin and it's impossible to rat proof them unless you totally wrap everything with hardware cloth. Hardware cloth of course rusts after a while so uh. you have to replace it. It just didn't work very well. Uh, we're in the center of this large residential area and our compost attracted all the neighborhood rats so we had to do something about that. Portland is not cool with harboring rats <laughs> in your compost. You can actually legally compost in any zoning area but you cannot harbor rats. So we tried to figure out a system that would work to get rid of the rats and what we came up with was these dry stack concrete blocks. You can see there's no mortar in these. I wasn't sensitive to it at first. I yeah. Think. Okay. As so a photographer, I'm sure you become really sensitive to start it. Start again yeah. with the blocks. Okay. We'll yes. Just make a cut. Okay. So yeah. So the the bins are constructed of dry stack concrete blocks. You'll see there's no mortar here, and you can uh, disassemble or deconstruct any of the bins, reconfigure them. For example, when you're harvesting, if you look over in that corner there, we've taken out all of the blocks on the rear. Oh yes! To allow oh, us see? to harvest from the other Doesn't side. Doesn't that make sense? Oh, you harvest from the garden exactly, side. Exactly, yes. So it allows you actually <laughs> to step in and then you replace the blocks and then start, a, start the process again. Wow! So this is our current most uh, recently filled bin. We actually filled this on Saturday and you can see what it looks like here. We are very, very careful with appearance. So the most you'll ever see in the bins is a layer of wood chips on top. Mm. Not cool to have banana peels and orange peels and right. really uh, ugly looking stuff or mm -hmm. covered with flies. It's really important to do this in a manner that uh, doesn't evoke uh, disgust. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes us about nine months to go around. So you'll see this bin was last filled 12 7 19. Actually, it's about 10 months ago. Uh, so about nine, 10 months, and we go full circle around the 11 bins. Mm. Each bin is two and a half cubic yards. 
uh, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. So we probably produce 25 to 30 cubic yards of compost per year just in this area here and a little bit less in the humanure area. So about 50, 60 cubic yards of compost per year nice. uh, between the two. Um, and I see one of my favorite uh, right. turning tools yeah, over we here. We actually don't uh, turn our piles in with a shovel. We use what's called the compost crank. So you'll notice this is kind of like an auger here, and when you crank it, it goes down into the pile, uh -huh. and then you pull it out. And this is used to aerate and fluff and mix the compost. Yeah. So you start with a layer of maybe about six inches or a foot. Once you've turned all that, mm -hmm. Then you go down another six or eight inches and you keep going down and down until you're all the way to the bottom. You can see how deep or how long the crank is. So right. this allows you to go down about four feet. But it's just so much easier than trying to, you know, hork and turn it over yeah. with a fork and with a hubba yeah. and a dirt. You can imagine if yeah. you wanted to turn this upside down into the bin next door, you'd spend an hour or That'd two. Be, yeah, it's no fun at all. And you can crank it. Cranking is not easy. It takes a fair amount of work. But you can do it in a half the time or maybe a third of the time. Mm -hmm. And then you can also take the, a few layers down so that you can really get down in there exactly. and you're not yeah. stressing your back. And you can yeah. do it from either side too, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Back saving. I love this. Right, right, yeah. this now, we, I mentioned we do about 50 cubic yards a year. So if you turn around, you can see that's an example of our uh, garden debris or garden refuse here. This is just right. chopped vegetation. Yeah. And then over here are the bins. These are kitchen scraps. Residents bring their kitchen scraps out. They dump it into mm. the five gallon buckets and then notice the top is also yes. covered with yes. wood chips. So yeah. again, aesthetics are really important. You never want to be able to see fresh raw compost. It can smell actually, especially in the summer too. So I'm sure that you must have a lot of people that garden here, right? Yeah, we actually, neighbors meet each other in the garden. So we have two kinds of gardening. Well, actually we have three kinds, but the two main kind of gardening, besides the ornamental beds, are the individual garden plots. That's a program that's modeled after a typical community garden program, like the Portland Community Gardens, where each individual has uh, one or more 10 by 10 plots. You can see them behind us here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in those plots the gardeners are in complete control of what they want to grow weeding and everything yeah then we also have the gar the, the group gardens program where a group of 25 to 30 gardeners mostly residents but we have a few neighbors who join us from nice. the greater neighborhood here uh -huh. we get together on a weekly basis uh, in pandemic times weekly basis with smaller work parties normally we have every three week work parties where we'll get 20 or 30 people together uh, and we do weeding planting uh, the garden program starts early in the year February or so when we plan out what the crops are going to be mm -hmm. and what's cool is that group of gardeners completely controls the program so they decide what to grow they plan the work parties they split the harvest they decide who's going to do what it works out really what varieties well. of things exactly, you're going to grow yeah, right, and right, yeah. oh nice and then the third kind of gardening here is um, a combination of ornamental gardens and fruit uh, trees uh, grapes and berries the perennial okay. yeah the perennial backbone. the perennial crops yes yeah. so we actually have a fruit team that manages that we do pruning we do harvesting we're talking now about uh, some uh, organic ways to prevent uh, infestation insect infestation like putting little bags around the fruits or clay we, sprays or clay or, spray we yeah. haven't done that yet but we're continuing to explore those mm -hmm. uh, different possibilities uh, and again we'll have a group uh, pruning parties and things like that. Do you hold classes for folks in the neighborhood? We have a couple of experts who are experts on pruning uh, and they've actually held multiple classes nice. uh, not only for our own benefit the resident benefit but we have neighbors from the area participating in those too so it's almost like being having a community center it is I mean, <laughs> it's like actually, being a community yeah. center and frankly uh, 
residents really meet each other in the gardens. What a great place to meet yeah. your neighbors gardening, yeah. really. And I bet it makes for a lot more harmonious living situation when people get a chance to meet each yeah. other, work together toward common goals, mm -hmm. instead of just all being sequestered away in their own little spaces. Right. Uh, I think this is just a model I would love to see in so many Thank other you. places. <laughs> it's just beautifully done. Thank you. And this is not to pretend that we don't have our own disagreements. We have disagreements. I mean, obviously, people living together, it can be quite a challenge at times. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, but this really is the kind of the social glue, you might say. Gardens are our social glue. Yeah. Ah, wonderful. Nice, nice stuff. And here we are on top of the world, right? This is the cupola. It's the highest point in the building. And we use the cupola to access our solar panels. You can see the entire south side of the roof is covered with solar panels. Uh, and it gives, gives a great view of the neighborhood. Look around. You Doesn't can see all does? the city around you. Uh, what I don't understand in America is rooftops are never used. It's one of the most beautiful places. You have a great view. It's, you're exposed to the sky. So we really need to utilize our roofs more. So that's why we put the cupola here. Mm, it's gorgeous. In fact, this whole place is gorgeous. Thank you so much. It was, uh, it's been a pleasure to <laughs> share some of our projects with you. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back. There's just so much to see here. Keep up the good work. Thank you. This is Laura from Raintree Nursery. We'll see you next time.